uh, critical mass over here. So we'll go ahead and get started uh, with our, our presentation. Uh, first off, by way of introduction, my name is Michael Plore, and I'm one of the admission counselors with College of the Holy Cross. And I'll be leading today's inside scoop, uh, how applications are read and admission decisions are made. Um, first off, before we get started, I want to note that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will actually be posted on our website for, for uh, later viewing. And we also do have a live closed captioning available for anybody who might be interested. Uh, but with that said, I want to say first off that I'm very excited uh, to be hosting this information session. Um, I think this is going to be one of the more unique sessions uh, that's, that's been offered by a college, as not only are we going to talk about the process of reading applications, how we review and how we come to consensus decisions, but we're actually going to get a chance to be able to show you one of our actual read and review sheets uh, that we utilize in our own admission committee process. So for partic particularly for those of you who are sophomores or juniors getting started with the process and starting to ask yourself that question of how do I make myself stand out in these application processes, this will be really the, the kind of pulling the curtain back, allowing you to see what are the factors that are that are most important to us when we're having our conversations regarding admissions decisions and the, the ways that you can think about improving your own application uh, before you even hit submit. You know, think about the things that, that are really going to stand out to us uh, in our re read and review processes. Um, before we do jump into the review sheet, and I also should note that all of the information we are going to show today is uh, is a fake person. It has been created and fabricated um, by our uh, our admissions staff, so there is no real information in here. Uh, but of course, again, it will be sort of that, that mock-up of, of what we would typically see in our own committee processes. But before I do show and share that, that read sheet, I want to start first with just how we review applications and how we actually get to that point of pulling up a review a read sheet. So for Holy Cross, we have a relatively extensive review process. We actually look at every single application we receive a minimum of three times before we actually make a final decision. So the first two reads that we do are done individually by two separate admission counselors. So the first things that our, our students will take a look at, uh, or excuse me, our counselors will take a look at uh, is going to be uh, just summarizing the application. So we're, we're gonna take all of the pieces of it. We're gonna look at the application itself. We're gonna look at the transcripts. We're gonna look at the recommendation letters that have been submitted to us, extracurricular involvement, demonstrated interest. Uh, we are a test optional institution, so if testing is there, we'll take a look at it. If not, though, then that's a, a perfectly uh, perfectly fine piece for us to, to be missing. We can certainly make decisions without test scores as part of our process. Um, all of these pieces, though, are essentially going to be summarized onto this read sheet by that first counselor. The first counselor who reviews an application is going to be a randomly assigned counselor in our office. We have 13 total admission counselors, and we all, of course, cover, cover different territories and different areas across the world that we're more familiar with. But by doing, by randomizing the first reads, it allows everybody in our office to get a greater context for what's out there, the different grading scales, the different transcripts, the different uh, weighting scales, as well as the designations for various courses that are out there, uh, higher level courses, I should say, that are out there for, for different schools, uh, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance in, in a high school transcript. And when you get a chance to review applications um, from across the country, it provides you with a greater perspective uh, that you can then bring into that admission committee and, and ultimately give greater context. The second review, the second read that we do is actually done by the territory counselor. So the person who travels to, to the high school, who gets to know the culture, the, the, the staff, the students, uh, and also has a better and greater understanding of, again, the particular offerings within an actual school, they're gonna do that second read. And they're really gonna do sort of a double check. So they're gonna make sure, of course, that the first reader caught all of the nuance that's there within each individual transcript. And they're also, of course, gonna be able to read up on any maybe new information that may have come in as the reads do sometimes happen in, in certain cases months apart. Um, we start reading applications typically right around early to mid-November, and we continue reading applications um, in, in earnest really until about um, uh, late December, early January. So, you know, there could be a couple month gap between that first and second read. So the second reader may pick up on some new information that's actually been, uh, been received in the admission process. Once we complete those two reads, we then have the two different summaries, again, on that read sheet from the two counselors. I wanna note that again, the summaries themselves are meant to provide context for the actual conversation that leads to a decision. So when we're in admission committee, it's all 13 admission counselors getting together uh, virtually or otherwise, we shall see exactly what next year brings, but this past year was a virtual process where we actually took a look again at these read sheets 
to gain an understanding of sort of what, what each student is bringing to this process. Um, what are we looking at from an academic perspective as well as what are we looking at from what's known as a community fit perspective? Because this idea of fit is really the, the overarching question that we're trying to, to answer. Is this student a good fit for Holy Cross? Both in the classroom, will they do well in the classroom? Will they be successful academically? But also again, from that community side, will they contribute to the various you know, clubs, organizations and activities and just the general community? Will they be an active member at Holy Cross? So those are the two pieces that we're trying to answer when we're in that committee room. And these read sheets, again, provide that context. So there is no one point of contact. There's no one point of information that's going to you know, make or break a decision necessarily. It's simply taking all of these factors together as one and allowing us again to be able to make that, that greater, have that greater conversation, I should say. With all of that said, uh, we will go ahead and jump right in here and I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get a chance to be able to see uh, the actual read sheet itself. So as I said before, uh, this, is, uh, this is the final product. So after we've done two different reads, this is actually what we pull up in our admission committee process and our review process, again, to be able to give context to those other 11 admission counselors who did not do the complete read. I will say for the two counselors who did the read initially, they're also using this to jog their memory as when we do reads, uh, we're gonna be reading about a thousand applications each between the first and the second read processes. Uh, so it is also helpful for even those first and second readers who did the read to look back on their notes and be able to say, oh, right, you know, I remember that essay or I remember making a note uh, about that extracurricular list or, or what have you and bring that to the attention of the group overall. But what you're gonna see here first and foremost is of course at the top some demographic information about the student, as I mentioned, and I'll restate it. This is all fake information that we have put together here just for this webinar. Um, first year applicant example being the name, gender if they choose to provide it. ESL is actually English as a second language. So in this case, this student has English as their second language. And to give you what, uh, where gives you, give you some context, excuse me, as to what that means, we have all of these tabs over here on the left-hand side as well. So not only do we have the summary on the read sheet of just the, the application in general from those first two readers and also from some of this uh, information being pre-populated, but we also have the ability to look at the detail. So if we see ESL is yes, we can actually go to the application. We can scroll down here and we can see their first language is actually Vietnamese, first language spoken, read and uh, spoken at home, excuse me, speak, read and write. Um, so is their first language. We can also see here that they're a freshman for the fall of 2021 and they are a regular decision applicant. So we offer two different ways for students to apply. We offer early decision and regular decision. Uh, early decision, of course, being your binding agreement, regular decision being your non-binding agreement. So the student applied through our regular decision non-binding process. Citizenship status of the US. We also have some ethnicity and cultural information based on what the student chooses to provide to us. This is all optional information, of course. And then you'll notice up here, these are actually what are known as tags. There can be various tags that students may get, but in this case, the student is a first generation student. So in other words, they are the first in their family uh, to be attending, attending, excuse me, a four year college or university in the United States. Um, I do wanna note that there is a blank space here. This would typically actually be populated with the high school information for each individual student. Unfortunately, our first year applicant example does not go to a real high school. So we cannot bring that information in as we do need an, an actual high school example there. But typically this would say where the student goes to high school, where that high school is located. Again, just giving us some geographic reference for where the students are coming from. Agency, also known as community-based organization, might be a little bit more of a familiar term or CBO. Um, so if students do work with a, a particular community-based organization, uh, some examples that are, that are a little bit more na national, I should say, uh, Upward Bound, um, TRIO, Summer Search. There are also many regional community-based organizations. There are hundreds of them across the country, quite literally. Uh, and so it is always helpful. Again, if a student is working with a CBO, they can provide us with that information and that would populate here in this box. It is of course a blank box. So this student in particular is not working with a CBO or an agency. Sibling, uh, this is actually looking at legacy information. So most schools do pay attention to what is known as legacy. So whether or not a student, uh, a prospective student, an applicant has family members who are either currently attending the college or have attended the college in the past. Um, so in our case, we will notice if a student has a sibling who is either currently attending or has attended Holy Cross. Similarly, we have that with, um, with alumni parents. So if mom, dad, parents, guardians, um, step parents attended uh, uh, the institution, then we would actually have that information available to us as well. Um, it's actually here in AO parents, alumni offspring is what that AO stands for. And that would be populated in this case. Uh, and then we do also pay attention to extended family. So students can tell us if they have cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, things like that. 
I want to note legacy is rarely going to really influence a decision. What it does is it lets us know how familiar a student might be with the college itself. It's important to note that I talked about that fact of fit. You know, is a student a good fit for our college or institution? That's the question that we're asking. But we want that idea of fit to be a two-way road. So in other words, how familiar is the student with this college? Do they feel like it could be a, fit, a good fit for them in their own process? And that's, uh, that's one of those pieces that gives us greater context to that question. If they have family members who have attended, if they have a sibling who's attended, if they have extended family or, of course, parents or guardians, then they're going to be a little bit more familiar with the college. Uh, maybe they've done a visit with their family members. If they have a sibling, maybe they've been to move-in day or, or visited them on campus or something along those lines. So it, again, just allows us to know that they know the culture of Holy Cross and they recognize that it could be a good fit place for them as well. In general, though, we're really, excuse me, we're going to be looking more at this context box, as it's known, uh, in order to get a sense of fit for our students. This is where we pay attention to demonstrated interest. So the points of contact that you have with a college throughout your college search process, those are what make up demonstrated interest. You actually being here right now in on this webinar, that's demonstrated interest for those of you that are juniors and, and sophomores that are in the process. It allows us to know that you know, you're interested in hearing about our process. You're interested in learning more about the college. So you'll notice here the student attended the junior advisory seminar. Uh, we also do have that they registered for a spring information session. So that's actually, uh, as of today, 423-2021. So we'll see if they've, they attend the information session later this afternoon, if, it, if it's going to be happening for them. Similarly, you'll notice up here, interviews. So we just recently had our uh, webinar earlier this week on interviewing skills and how you can improve your skills in a, in a college interview. Holy Cross is a college, of course, that offers interviews. We actually strongly recommend interviews in our process. They are not required. But if a student does an interview, then we're actually going to see up here who they interviewed with as well as the interview rating. So we do have a rating system for our interviews. It's on a one to five scale, five being the greatest interview that we've ever had before in our lives, one being a student swore at us and kicked us in the shins. Uh, three is gonna be your most typical interview that we see, typical interview rating. Uh, and then fours are, you know, the students stood out. They were, you know, ex especially enthusiastic in the interview or they were especially um, just somebody who stood out to us in the conversation. And a four interview really just allows us to see, okay, this is gonna be a pretty good interview we're likely going to want to take a look at that right up over here, which I'll show you in just one minute and see what that counselor had to say about them. Similarly with the two, you know, maybe they were just giving short yes or no answers. Maybe they weren't particularly enthusiastic about the interview. Um, those are the type of factors that could lead to it too. But if you're interested in learning again about sort of how to brush up your interview skills, you can certainly take a look uh, at the webinar that we offered earlier as, as that will be archived on our website as well. Over here in this box, we actually have our high school information. So all of this is primarily pre-populated by the actual uh, high school or uh, guidance counselor or college counselor in that they fill out, and I'll show you quickly where this information is coming from on the transcript in the school report, they fill out this school report. So this is something that's uh, standard across the common application. If you apply to the coalition application, another application that the Holy Cross accepts, they have their own version of the school report, but essentially the school counselor will put all the general information in here. So the name, of course, the town, uh, where the, app, uh, the website, and then down here, this is where we're really where we're pulling this information from. So class size, college, uh, percentage of students who go to four and two-year institutions. Um, we're also going to see here uh, the curriculum that's offered, so how many AP level courses, honors level courses that might be available. And then if we scroll on over, we'll see specific information to the student. So their actual class size, if they have a rank, in this case the school does not rank their students, uh, GPA and whether or not it's weighted or unweighted, and then the highest GPA in the class. And also you can see here curriculum most demanding. So these are actually, um, um, uh, in, this is information I should say that's preset by the common application. So they actually will ask, what is the level of the curriculum of this particular student? And it's up to that college counselor, high school counselor to say, you know, they're taking the most demanding curriculum, a very demanding curriculum average. It's again, pre-populated prompts that the common application has. And all of this actually then comes through here. So you can see here, rigor of the curriculum, most percent to four year, 99%. Weighted GPA. You'll notice before that it actually said 4.06, and now it says 4.09. I also want to point out that we do ask for mid-year or semester grades for students, and so if that is the case, we'll get a mid-year report, uh, which provides in many cases an updated GPA. So if you do share with us those semester grades and your GPA takes that little bit of a bump, then in that case, whoops, excuse me, 
uh, then we will actually see here uh, that the student has uh, bumped their GPA up as a result of their semester grades. The scale of the GPA is on a 4.0. And then the other piece of context that's quite helpful for us because a 4.0 scale uh, can vary greatly from schools and not every single school operates on a 4.0 scale. Um, we actually use what is known as GDC if a school does not provide rank. This is the grade distribution chart that, each, that not every single school will provide, but some will. And they give us a range of where GPAs fall within the class. So in this case, this student's GDC falls within approximately 12% of the class, and it's a weighted GDC. So that just, again, gives us some context. What does that 4.09 GPA mean, especially, again, with this sort of high GPA, which actually didn't populate, but that was that 4.52, the highest of the valedictorian of that class in particular is getting a 4.52. 409, obviously the student is, is doing pretty well in terms of the classes that they're taking. Offered over here, again, you can see 26 AP level courses as well as advanced math. So this was actually filled out by the counselor and they were able to point out that yes, they offer AP curriculum and they have AP classes, but there is also advanced math courses. So this is a different designation that the, that the high school is using to indicate that their math courses are actually a higher level, even though they may not necessarily be that AP level course. And we get that information in addition to the transcripts. We also receive a school profile. So just about every single high school is going to send us a school profile. This is where we get that context, If the, especially for the first counselor. Again, that random counselor who's kind of reading the application and may not necessarily be as familiar with the high school as the second counselor, they can use this profile. So we can look through, we can see curriculum. They offer an all honors curriculum. So that's why we didn't actually note that they offer any honors courses as all of their classes aside from the AP level are considered honors. Others, uh, other pieces that you'll see here, students are limited to three AP courses during junior year and only permitted to take four in senior year. That's another really important contextual piece to have in mind and one of the reasons why it's highlighted here by that first counselor. So they actually looked at it, saw that was important and then highlighted that in the process. We have the list of the AP courses that are being offered. We also have unique course offerings. And again, this is where it states the advanced courses in the mathematics are there that are not necessarily carrying with that designation. So you'll notice down here when we actually do the read and the review of the application itself, we then summarize that transcript again within the context of the, the, the designations that the school is providing us. So right over here, we have ninth, 10th, 11th and 12th grade. We have the amount of core courses, academic core courses that they've taken in each of these years. So the academic core courses are gonna be the mathematics, the sciences, natural sciences, humanities, English, history courses, um, you know, the general sort of academic courses that most students are taking throughout high school. We're gonna count those. Um, ceramics, gym, uh, lunch, those are not gonna get counted as academic core courses. So just so you're aware of um, what we're counting there. The level of those courses, so obviously, as I mentioned, there's the advanced math curriculum that is available here. So the student has actually been taking advanced math courses, which we do note down, and then they're able to hop into some AP level courses. Another you know, contextual piece to keep in mind here is, that, as I mentioned before, they let us know that the limit of APs is three in junior year. So the student has actually taken the maximum amount of, of AP level courses they can be taking. And then they actually said that they could take four, though there was an additional, uh, they do need an additional recommendation in order to take four. So I'm assuming uh, at this high school, three is a, a pretty strong course load to be taking, um, which lines up well with, again, the most uh, demanding curriculum that the counselor put down. And then that does, does actually play into our academic rating, which I'll talk about in just one second. Over here, you can see the list of the AP courses that the student actually take and took, I should say. And so this is the same for if your high school has its own advanced curriculum that they may not necessarily designate as AP. Uh, IB uh, is another area there that we may see international baccalaureate classes. These are the types of courses that we'll list on here to say that the student has taken AP world history, environmental sciences, biology, language and, and, uh, and composition, European history, BC calc, and then chemistry. So it allows us just to have that context of how has a student challenged themselves? Not only is what is the number of those courses, but what are those courses that, that they actually have taken? And then you can see how do, down here, there's an actual formula that comes together and says they've taken three total advanced classes and seven total AP classes uh, in, their, in their four years of high school. Senior year grades. So these grades right here are mid-year grades. That's what MIG, MYG means. Uh, we may also receive first quarter grades. We may also receive first trimester grades from students or from counselors, I should say, in high schools. Um, this is just that designation of exactly what these grades are. And then testing, no. So as I mentioned earlier, we are a test optional institution. This is indicating that this student has decided to go test optional. No, they are not submitting their test scores, SATs or ACTs in the process. That's a, that actually triggers a couple of different pieces here in this read sheet. 
One is that means we will not see the test scores uh, on the actual read sheet itself, but also over here on these tabs, you'll notice that there is no, what is known as a testing tab. If a student were to take, or were to say yes, I should say, to SATs or ACTs, then we would actually have a testing tab we could click on that would allow us to see the SATs and ACTs. But by them saying no, it actually completely takes it out of our hands. We can't even see the test scores. Uh, and really the goal there is to completely eliminate them from the decision process entirely, if that is the case. And I should note, going test optional really has no no bearing on our process. Um, we're a school that's been going test optional and has been test optional, I should say, um, coming up on 16 years, if I'm not incorrect, uh, 15 or 16 years, I could be a year off there. But regardless, it's been a long standing policy at Holy Cross uh, that we've been reading applications with and without test scores. And what is most important to us, and you can see why, is going to be transcripts. There's so much more information here that we can pull out, that we can take a look at, the level of courses, trends in grades. Obviously, the student has been getting consistent A's and B's throughout high school, the actual courses themselves that they've been taking. And then again, so that the total amount that's over here, GPA information as well, GDC and rank, if that's provided to us, uh, are going to be other pieces that can give us greater context. And that's perfectly fine. I, I, I want to note that we understand not every single school offers a rank or offers a GDC, and that's perfectly fine. It's just a matter of, again, providing us with context. If we don't have that rank and don't have that GDC, um, we certainly have other ways to determine what, what sort of the, the, the GPA means. And if we ever have a question, if we ever have uh, an issue in terms of what is the, you know, this, this 4.0 GPA, or maybe a school doesn't even calculate a GPA, is that something that's somewhat common out there with various high schools? One of the things that we can do as counselors, we can pick up the phone and we can call a high school counselor, a college counselor very easily and be able to say, hey, can you provide us with a little bit of context here as to what this means? So it's never gonna be a static, uh, a static um, uh, feature here in terms of what these, these numbers are. There's always sort of the opportunity to add more context and get more information if ever necessary. So I want to actually scroll down here to the read itself. So as I said, not only do we actually put in sort of the, 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 the actual information, um, the nuts and bolts of the information, I should say, but we also put in our own notes and our own summaries. So you'll notice up here we have a couple of academic rating and personal rating fields. Academic rating is actually a, it's a scale that ranges from two to nine. And don't ask me why that is. It just is the way that it is. Uh, but a nine is the highest academic rating that we can provide. And a two is the lowest academic rating that we can provide. The academic rating is based primarily on GPA and transcripts. So we're looking at, of course, the grades themselves. We're looking again, if it's provided GDC and rank, uh, where a student falls in their class. We're looking here as well at the context of their curriculum. So in this case, I mentioned earlier, this student is likely taking the maximum amount of AP level courses that they can take. They're getting A's and high B's throughout the, the, the course of their entire four-year experience. They actually said no to testing, and yet they still got a nine, uh, the highest academic rating that we can provide from one of our admission counselors. The second counselor decided to give them an eight. This is incredibly important to note that the academic rating is subjective. It is totally up to the counselor as to what they think the academic rating should be. And it is done so that we can read within context of the strength of the pool. So as we do some of our read and review processes, maybe we're gonna look at some higher rated applicants altogether. Maybe we'll look at sort of the middle of the pool on another day. Maybe we'll look at some lower rated applicants, so on and so forth. It just provides us with sort of a way to organize the application pool. It is by no means a, a set decision. Um, and this student in this case, is actually what's going to be known as an 8.5 as we take both of those uh, academic ratings, we average them together, and that gives us sort of our general academic rating. So they're an 8.5. That's a pretty high academic rating. It does not mean that they are an automatic admit for us. It means that we still need to have the conversation. Uh, do we feel like the student is going to be an academic fit at Holy Cross? Probably with an 8.5 academic rating for sure, but we still have to have that conversation again about the overall community fit aspect, as well as consider the overall pool of applicants that we're looking at. If we have a particularly strong applicant pool, then maybe we're going to see students who are in that higher rating uh, who may not necessarily get the admit. I mean, obviously, it's going to give them maybe a better chance to get the admit, but at the same time, again, it's not a guarantee of a decision. That's incredibly important to note. This is all just contextual, providing us an opportunity to be able to organize. Similarly with personal rating, this is actually on a one to five scale. So it's actually the same scale that I talked about earlier with our interviews in that five is, you know, just a really fantastic person. Uh, one is going to be somebody who just cursed all over their application for us. So <laughs> that's sort of the range that we look at. Three is the most common rating that we see. Um, fours, again, is something that just stood out there about the application. And these are generally going to be looking really at the other pieces of the application to determine personal rating. So recommendation letters, essay, extracurricular involvement, 
then maybe the student's been in contact with us. Maybe we've heard from them and we know them and we've met them and we just like them and we want to give them that personal four. We have that ability and that flexibility to do that as counselors. Um, I should also note these are completely separate from one another. So we could have a nine who's a one. We could have a five who's a two. Uh, again, academic rating is meant to be completely separate from that personal rating, but it provides us with that context. In this case, the student actually got a 3.5 personal rating. Again, you got the three from the first reader and the four from the second reader. Um, and that's of note, you know, a student got a four personal rating. Okay, something about them personally stands out to this counselor, uh, which is great to know. So again, as we're reading and reviewing, this is sort of the thought that's going through our mind, particularly if I'm in that group of, of 11 counselors who didn't read the application already. So we'll look here at the notes and to give you some clarity as to what some of these abbreviations mean, see rec up top, counselor recommendations. So just about every single student is going to send to us uh, a counselor, a college counselor or a guidance counselor recommendation letter. We will summarize that, you know, in a couple of sentences quickly. Teacher recommendation is gonna be TREC. Uh, we also receive recommendation letters from anybody else who knows you well, and we will read through those as well. So in this case, we have a research mentor recommendation letter. So not a teacher, not a counselor, but somebody else in your life who has wrote a recommendation letter about you. Very cool to know about, you know, some, some of the different um, qualities of this student uh, that are outside of the classroom or separate from sort of the traditional recommendation letters. It gives us, again, greater context. The interview, INT. So I mentioned earlier, we have that interview up here with the personal rating of four, but now we wanna know sort of why is that a four interview? So we look down here, we have this similar, uh, we have this summary, I should say, of the interview. Mature and thoughtful, I appreciated his willingness to try new things. The essay, learning to tie his shoes, really creative and well-written. This is typically what a note, uh, the notes are gonna consist of when it comes to an essay, sort of a quick summary of what the essay was actually all about. Uh, how was it? In this case, a very creative essay and grammatically well-written essay, well put together. The student took some time to edit it uh, and obviously make sure that, you know, they're showing us that they really care about this essay in the process. Um, COVID. So this is a question that the Common Application added this past year. Coalition Application also added it, where you're able to state any type of um, unique challenges that may have come about as a result of COVID. Um, this was primarily put in place so that not every single student would write their college essay about COVID. Um, for those of us that read applications, I mentioned it's about a thousand a year. Uh, we really don't want to read a thousand essays about COVID. It would probably uh, bum us out a little bit. So the COVID question was a welcome addition uh, by many colleges and universities. They really encouraged the Common Application to take advantage of this and they were able to respond and provide this. So students can actually say, this is how COVID affected uh, my life, my academic experience. So they have made the note of this here that obviously challenges with virtual learning, increased responsibilities at home. That's incredibly important to note since particularly when you're at home, you know, you're not necessarily just um, doing school from home. You're sort of living at school in a lot of ways. And we understand that there are a lot of unique challenges that come with that. And then he's still, you know, happy that he's still able to involve himself in clubs and organizations. Uh, I mentioned we do keep track of, of extended family. So students can tell us if they have aunts, uncles, cousins, whatever it might be that have also attended Holy Cross. And so in this case, they have a cousin who's class of 2016. This is the list of extracurricular activities that the student has been involved in. So they were a research assistant. They're the vice president of the pre-med society, part of the ant bullying club. So you'll notice that's there in quotes. So there's a little bit of a spelling error that's going on there. Uh, it seems that this uh, student isn't a huge fan of insects. Uh, service, tour guide, class vice president, family responsibilities, and an altar server. And then you can see down here, this last line is actually what's known as our bottom line. So at the end of the full summary, the counselors will then say, what was their impression of the application? In. It's important to note that a bottom line rarely is going to be a recommendation for a decision. You notice that they're not saying this student is clearly an admit, this student is clearly a deny or, or XYZ. They're saying he seems like a really hardworking student with a great sense of humor. From there, we're going to go down to the second read. So this is our counselor who would actually cover this territory. They would travel to this high school and know the high school. They're going to do a second read, again, basically double checking the first reader's work. So they're going to look through and they're likely, in this case, this second counselor is the one who made that note about the three advanced math courses. As again, that's something that's a little bit unique to that high school that, that the counselor would be responsible for catching that little bit of nuance. Um, and, you know, maybe the first counselor saw it and put it in, but the second counselor is there as that safety net just in case they happen to miss it. They're going to do a second read on the application. So they have their own notes on the council recommendation. In this case, uh, PREC is actually parent or guardian recommendation letter. We do actually accept and encourage parent and guardian le recommendation letters in our process, uh, mostly because they're very fun to read. They come with some of the best stories by far uh, that you can imagine that we would receive. Uh, but if we do get one, then we will, of course, summarize it here. 
HCR, this is what's known as the Holy Cross response. So here's the tab over here. And I will go through these tabs. I should also note, I'm sorry um, for not saying that earlier, to see exactly where, where all this information is coming from. But just to give you again context, HCR, Holy Cross response is somewhat of a supplement, I guess you could call it. But really, it's just a simple additional question that we ask students to provide greater context related to demonstrated interest. So the question is, how have you gotten to know Holy Cross in your college search process? Or how have you been able to learn about Holy Cross in your search process? So maybe students will tell us about summer visits to campus with an alum cousin. Uh, they attended a live webinar, watched the archive webinar. So we can see up here, we know that they attended that junior advisory seminar. You know, it's, it's there in our notes, but we didn't know that they had a summer visit to campus with an alum cousin. That was just sort of a, a walk around campus. They didn't register with the admission office to do that. So we wouldn't know about that unless they shared that story with us. Um, watch the archive webinar. That's another piece. I wouldn't have known that you had went to our website and watched the archive webinar. And then theater involvement, you know, they can also share any additional information that they want to with us in that Holy Cross response. SC, this is student correspondence. So you can see over here, student correspondence is actually what that's referring to. So these are any type of email correspondences, uh, thank you notes, um, really any way that a student may have interacted with us personally, especially as a counselor, we're gonna actually add that to the application file. And this is another way, again, that sort of adds to that piece of demonstrated interest and also contributes to that idea of a personal rating. So having that HCR, that optional piece that a student submitted to us, Awesome to see. Again, it shows extra effort on the student's part, a great way to really be able to enhance the application and show them, show us, I should say, that they care about Holy Cross in their own process. SC, again, you know, they've, they've followed up with a thank you note after their interview. That's, that's great to see. And then you can see here, they also did a, a review on the essay. So the merits of bunny ears versus loop, swoop and pull and loved it was the essay. So again, just, you know, quick notes, things that really give us, again, the other 11 counselors in the, in the room, some context as to what the first readers were thinking about that, about each individual piece of the application. Then you can see down here, this is Tom, Tom's bottom line. Can't decide whether I'm more impressed by him academically or personally, regardless, I'm a huge fan. Once again, not a recommendation for a decision, but certainly, you know, it seems to be reading very well for this student. That's a great thing to see. And it's gonna, you know, give that impression to the, to the counselors who are reading through. So maybe after, after we've looked at this summary, you know, where imagine yourself in that group of 11 that didn't do the full read, but you're sort of looking through these notes and these summaries, and you want to say, all right, what is this ant bullying club all about? Why do we put that in quotes? We have these tabs here so that we can actually go back again to all of these pieces of the application very quickly. So whoever is doing what is known as driving, uh, so they're the ones who are actually going to be sort of going through this detail for the other 12 who are all staring at a projector screen or a shared screen or whatever it might be. They can have, they may hear, hear a question from somebody in the group. So maybe I'm looking at that and I'm saying, what's Ant Bullying Club? What's that all about? And maybe the first counselor, like I said, they did the read maybe a couple months ago and they said, you know what, I put that in the notes and maybe I don't totally remember, but let's go take a look at the extracurricular page. So we're going to go on over here and we're going to look through and we're going to see that they actually co-founder of the anti-bullying club is what they had meant to put. Unfortunately, spell check doesn't always catch everything, particularly when you do put, again, something that is an actual word there. So they're saying that they're the ant bullying club. Is this going to be something that, you know, again, influences the decision? Likely not, not going to be the end of the world for this student. It's just something, again, that's of note uh, that there is there uh, a little bit of a spelling error. Um, and also, again, gives us a little bit of a chuckle. Uh, but hey, if we ever want to see a little bit more here of the, uh, the extracurricular activities, we can, again, go to this page, Vice President, Class of 2021. And it gives us this detail here that we can take a look at if ever necessary. Um, I will say we cheated on the essay. Unfortunately, I don't have the actual uh, essay itself. We're just using here a little bit of filler itself. Uh, but typically, you know, if there was that essay we would go through, we would be able to read in this in full detail, particularly if those first two counselor notes to go back here were saying really creative and well-written and then, you know, loved it. That's an essay that many of us in the room would want to say, hey, let's pull that up. Let's take a read of that essay all together as a group. Um, similarly with our uh, Holy Cross response. So I mentioned earlier, this is what I had talked about with that optional piece that a student may fill out and add to the application. Another way, again, a student can strengthen an application in our process. We can actually say, all right, what is it? What is the full, uh, uh, full HCR that they sent to us? So again, we can see exactly what that first reader said. Attended campus over the summer, junior advisory day session, hope to attend a virtual information session. And then this is, again, the additional information about their involvement in the theater company uh, at their high school. So these are just really nice things to see, see the effort there. Uh, similarly, with a parent recommendation letter, um, you know, 
You can imagine many of these are glowing. Many of these are, are very positive to read, but they're always fun to go through too, because again, there's an interesting story that shows the strength of character and their empathy. Um, these are, I think, one, one of the biggest reasons why we ask for parent and guardian recommendation letters. So often they can really give us that context of a student's actual character as a person. Um, so often the other recommendation letters, and if we go over here, again, we can see these other recommendation letters. So here's the counselor recommendation. Uh, and we'll go through math teacher sent one. Um, and then we also have that research um, research mentor that I mentioned earlier that we saw. Again, some of these are a little bit, little bit of cheated there, but that's okay. We do have the summaries there. Um, but regardless, the parent recommendation letters are gonna kind of break out of that sort of one factor where a teacher recommendation letter is kind of looking at you, the student, or if you have a coach, for instance, write a recommendation letter, it's kind of you, the athlete. But those parent guardian recommendation letters really, again, can give us some great context there. Similarly with the interview. So we saw if I was reading through this uh, in that committee room and I saw a four interview from Nicole and I saw, you know, I mature and thoughtful and something else, I, I wanna see a little bit more. Um, click on the interview, boom, let's pull that up. Let's take a look at this write up here and see the full write up in detail. This is incredibly important to note that this is what an interview write up looks like. It's a summary of the conversation. I tell students all the time, if you were to do a write up of the conversation after we finished up in the same way that the counselor was, it would likely look really similar to this because they're gonna be saying what they talked about in their interview. They're gonna be saying some of the things that they involved themselves in, uh, what they're looking for out of their college search process. And then down here, there is a little bit of a bottom line, a little bit of an opinion that's put in there from the, uh, from the counselor. You know, one of the things that I appreciated about the student, something that stood out to me. And generally this is gonna give us that context to why, she, why Nicole in this case provided that four rating in the interview itself. So again, we have that opportunity there to be able to pull up some additional information. Similarly with the transcripts, and this is probably gonna be one of the more common pieces that we pull up, because maybe we actually wanna see, all right, A's and B's, what does the, the, the actual um, detail of the transcript look like? We gotta look at the profile. We gotta look to see again, sort of what is offered, but then we wanna see the actual transcript itself. And so we can see here again, this is that 409. So these are mid-year senior grades that we have in place here. Um, I also want to note just how, how pretty this transcript is for any college counselors uh, who may be on this call. Um, we really appreciate a neat, clean transcript uh, that saves our eyes. And this is a really great example of one um, where it just simply provides, you know, a nice list of the subject areas that they've taken, the level of those classes are in here, and again, the grades themselves. So if we ever wanted to, again, take a look in a little bit of greater detail at the actual transcript itself, we always have that opportunity uh, to be able to do so. And again, I want to note that those academic core courses that are being counted in here, so English, history, algebra, Latin, French, and bio, those are six academic core courses. High school string technique, even though they got a grade on it, we're not going to count that as an academic core course necessarily that a student has taken, though of course it is notable that the student has been involved uh, in, in band and in orchestra during their time in high school. But again, it's not necessarily going to count to that, that, that six count. And once again, you can do the same here for all of these years, English, history, advanced Latin, so on and so forth. Um, so that just provides you again, a little bit more context there. So once we have all of this in place, once we've sort of gone through that process of reading the review sheet and pulling up the detail of the transcript, that is then what's going to inform the conversation. So I mentioned already, we have those 11 admission, 13 admission counselors total, I should say, in that room together. We are now all caught up to speed with what this applicant has brought to the table and how they've really been able to influence, influence the application itself. And again, just to give you that context, for those of you that are sophomores, juniors, you know, what are the things that you can do to think about to really uh, to strengthen your application? Look again at these pieces, contact box right here. You have direct control over that contact box, what gets populated in there in terms of doing the interview, in terms of doing the information sessions, um, tours of campus, for instance, which we will be offering in person this upcoming summer. Um, you'll be able to take a tour of campus. That's another piece of demonstrated interest, information sessions. What are some of the other ways? So particularly getting into, uh, if you're looking at um, junior or senior year course selection, you know, thinking about challenging yourself with some of the higher level courses that are available to you. It doesn't mean you need to be this student. You don't need to take the absolute maximum of what is available and what's offered to you. You want to be intentional and discerning about the level of courses that you're challenging yourself with. So look at the subject areas that you feel like are your strengths. Look at the subject areas where you feel comfortable uh, taking those classes, learning about that material, and say, hey, maybe I want to jump into that honors level, high honors, advanced, accelerated, AP, whatever the designation might be. Maybe I want to take on that extra challenge at that point. 
Um, similarly, looking through here, some other pieces uh, that can really influence the essay. This is such an important piece for us. We look at almost every single essay that we receive in full detail beyond just the, the summary of notes that are here, because they provide us again with that personal piece to the application itself. It's that individual story that you're sharing with us, which again, shines some light on the character of who you are. Similarly with extracurricular involvement, you know, thinking about the things that you're a part of now, is there anything that you also want to add or maybe are there opportunities for leadership positions? Because again, we will keep track of that. VP of the pre-medical uh, pre society, class VP over here, and even things like family responsibilities. Those are things that we look at as extracurricular activities for students. Because again, that's something that you're dedicating your time to um, outside of the classroom setting and outside of the classroom experience. Other ways, again, the Holy Cross response, something else that your students will actually receive a link to. This is important just to note in the future, the link comes after an application is submitted. So you'll not find a link or, or, or an example of a Holy Cross response um, at any point right now. But after an application is submitted, a student has that option to be able to add this to the application file itself. So again, these are all the little pieces that kind of come together and allow us to be able to say, look at you know what we like about this applicant what is it that really makes us want to say yes in this case i should also note student correspondence again here's the thank you note that the student sent on over to us um short sweet but again something that we note and pay attention to uh in that a student is actually saying it was great meeting you it was great talking to you thank you so much for taking your time so these are all the ways that you know you can start to think about how can i make my application stand out um, i should note again this is all within context of holy cross each school is going to have sort of their own different process for a read process um, for making decisions, though largely many schools are going to be sort of treating it this way. They want to get a kind of a summary of the applicant. They want to get sort of an idea of how the student might actually fit into the, the context of, of the college, community of the college, I should say. And then from there, they want to sort of involve many different voices in that process to make that final determination. To actually make a decision at Holy Cross, we do so by a vote. So after we finish up our reads, our reviews, our full committee and our full conversation, however long all of that takes, I should note an application read, each individual read those first two reads, they can take anywhere from probably five to 10 minutes. Um, they're not a terribly long process as obviously, as I mentioned, we have about a thousand applications to read each. So we are sort of going through those quickly to get these, uh, these notes in here. But the committee conversations, those can last upwards of 15, 20, 30 minutes. Sometimes we're taking uh, applications, we're looking at them, we're having a conversation, we're realizing that we're not coming to a consensus. Maybe we'll set that application aside, we'll pick it up later and sort of see how it looks within the context of the pool. And that's another piece to note as well. Like I said, these academic ratings, these uh, notes on the applications, things like that, nothing guarantees a decision. The context of the pool really dictates, again, what it's going, what that decision is going to be. So it could be a chance that, you know, we have an 8.5 student, super high rated, looks really strong overall. Uh, but maybe, again, it's an overly competitive year. And maybe that student, you know, falls in, into the waitlist category as a result of that. Unfortunately, there's really no way to say exactly how that's going to look. And it's one of the reasons why it's hard to give concrete answers uh, so often when we're talking about the abstract of how do we make decisions or what's going to, you know, sort of push my application into the admit pool. Um, but it is helpful, again, just to know what this actually looks like. So with all of that said, um, I do want to jump here uh, into our um, jump here into our Q&A and I'm just pulling it up here. All right. So oh, what are pings? I'm so sorry. I, that's a great question. So pings are actually going to be the, the uh, points, um, uh, the, the uh, points of contact that you have with us on the website. Um, so what happens here uh, on the back end essentially is that if students fill out forms, things like that, then IP addresses actually do get captured uh, in the system. This is the case for many different schools. And so we can actually see when that IP address actually visited our, our website. Um, so in this case, a student has zero pings. Doesn't really mean a whole lot, to be completely honest. It just means that and we just don't have any record of them visiting our website, but they obviously mentioned that they have seen the uh, the webinar on our website. So the assumption is that they've seen it. It's just, again, another sort of reference point when it comes down to it. Uh, let's see, in the way that you look at an IB diploma applicant, similar or different, um, it's gonna be strikingly similar when it comes down to, I'm sorry, I'm realizing that I'm pulling that into the shared, uh, <laughs> shared screen, I'm sorry for that, and blocking over here the read sheet. Um, so over here, the IB courses would actually be noted here instead of AP, we would count again those IP, IB level courses as part of it. Again, this is all contextual. It's what's available to each individual student in their high school. So we're really gonna be looking up here first to see what is offered, 26 AP courses, and then we're gonna to go to that, to that profile to see again, what are some of the limits that might be on those offerings? So all of this is again, taken in with a, with a grain of salt, taken in the context, I should say, of your high school and what is offered.
Uh, how do uh, how do colleges? Uh, I'm sorry. What percentage of students have been accepted that are, are that have applied test optional in the process? Uh, and so, really, what does it mean to be a test optional institution? Um, so, from Holy Cross's perspective, again, we're a test optional school because the reason is testing really just doesn't give us a great indication of a student's ability to move forward in a successful manner into the college environment. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but primarily because the way that testing assesses your ability, it's just not the way that colleges do it. We don't have you sit down on Saturday mornings doing four hour exams to just determine whether or not you're capable as a student, whether or not you should earn, a, earn a, a college degree. Rather, what we do is very similar to what you see on the high school level. We do quizzes, we do tests, we do papers, we do presentations, we do group work, we do discussion work and participation grades. All of the similar pieces that you see in a high school uh, transcript, how they evaluate you as a student, very much carry over into the college level. And that's why we pay so much more attention to transcripts, GPA, the work that's done over a three and a half year sustained period versus again, that four hour exam on a Saturday morning. So when it comes to test optional, if a school is test optional, then that's likely their thinking. That again, a test score is not necessarily gonna be representative of a student in every single case. Oftentimes when it comes to, uh, to the test score, it's really just looking at the number kind of shrugging our shoulders and saying, okay, great. Uh, and then moving on from there. Uh, so I'm looking here, we actually have a student who's an international student. In my country, I don't have an option for more or less advanced courses. Um, that's not only, that's not simply just for international students. There are schools, of course, in high school, or in America, I should say, um, that are also not offering any type of leveling. And that's perfectly fine. Again, it's something that we're going to take into consideration in the read and review process. We're going to say, okay, this student doesn't have the option to take advanced uh, AP, IB level courses, and that's not going to be any type of disadvantage to that student. It's just how the high school has set up their own curriculum, and in that case, we're going to, of course, look, look a little bit deeper into the classes that they've taken individually, and still, again, look at those grades, and if necessary, as I mentioned, we can always call that school, and we can say, can you provide us some greater context? Uh, we have a question here, does uh, Holy Cross look at Regents scores? So for those of you from the New York area, you're familiar, I'm sure, of course, with the Regents exams. Uh, for those not from New York, Regents are state-specific exam scores that some, uh, that some states will actually put on their, uh, on their transcripts. Um, largely, the answer is no. We don't pay too much attention to any type of state uh, scores that may be provided through some of those, um, those proficiency exams, primarily because they're kind of look the same as, um, as standardized tests, as that's really what they are. Um, they're really just, again, one piece in one context of uh, uh, of your work in sort of that um, that exam setting, which isn't necessarily going to be a great representation of you, the student. So largely, no, any type of state uh, exams don't really carry much weight as part of the process. I was wondering how much weight is placed on AP exams if I submit them. So that is an optional piece that students can submit to us. And I should also bring that over here. I'm sure uh, I may have seen that as I came over. This student did decide to submit to us their AP exam scores or at least self-report their AP exam scores in the process. Um, it's something, again, that's just going to provide greater context. So if a student has uh, you know, got the five on AP Lang, fantastic. They got the three on AP World History. Okay. Um, it's not necessarily going to make or break a decision. But if a student feels like they've done well on those AP exam scores, and they want to share them with us, great, you're welcome to. If you don't want to share them with us, that's fine. Again, no assumptions are being made that just because you've taken some AP classes and you're not sharing the exam with us um, that you either did or didn't do well on the exams, it just means that, okay, we just don't have those scores and that's the case. But if a student decides to submit them, then of course we'll see them and we'll have that context in place if that is the case. Uh, let's see. In high school, I've had significant medical issues with interfered by learning ability. Do you have any recommendations for students with special circumstances? Yes, absolutely. So if you have anything that can provide greater context to a transcript. So if, for instance, this student had A's, A's, and then all of a sudden we saw B's and C's in junior year, and then they were back to A's in senior year, for instance, then it often is the case that we would actually go to the application, we would look back over here, and we're gonna see here, again, this community disruption, this is actually gonna be the COVID question essentially that's being asked, um, but down here, there would actually be another block that would say additional information. So within this portion of the common application, students can say anything that you want to. Um, if you want to share with us some type of, again, maybe dip in grades, if you want to share with us some extenuating circumstances that may have affected uh, a transcript or something along those lines, you can add that in that additional information section. 
Another way that you can share that information with us is through an interview. Another reason why we do offer and recommend those interviews in the process, because we can sit down and we can talk about what happened uh, as a result, uh, you know, what extenuating circumstance actually did um, contribute to uh, some type of dip in grades or something along those lines. I will also note generally, if that is the case, then college counselors will usually put their own information here. So as we go to the counselor recommendation, maybe we would see in one of these paragraphs um, that the student, you know, maybe had a, a, a little bit of a family issue or medical issue or something something like that, that actually contributed to those grades. So oftentimes we're gonna have that context, but I still recommend the students be proactive about sharing again, some of that additional information with us, whether it be through an interview or through the additional information section there. Uh, how important is student correspondence to the applications? What would some opportunities, uh, what would some opportunities be to correspond more often with schools? Um, it's not necessarily going to be, again, a be all end all of the process, but it's always nice to know if a student has emailed with us, if they have reached out to us at all. Um, we have all of our counselor contact information on our admissions website, and we also have all of our territories broken down there. So you're always able to find who your admission counselor is, who's traveling to your high school. And if you ever want to shoot them an email and just say, hey, you know, I wanted to introduce myself, wanted to let you know I'm super interested in Holy Cross. Um, that's something that's, you know, again, great to see. It's going to inform us of this idea of community fit and the fact that the student has done their full research on the college and has been getting to know us in a variety of ways. Um, so again, it's something that really is going to work in a student's favor. It once again, won't necessarily lead to an admit in every single case, but it can never hurt in the process to know that a student has been actively engaging with us and reaching out to us. Some of the other ways that's, that students can interact with us, not just via email, but also through through some of the visit opportunities that we do. Um, I have to say, I'm not sure exactly what fall visit season will look like, but typically uh, we do travel to various high schools and we get to know, you know the, the college counselors and also meet with interested students during those high school visits. So if you ever see that Holy Cross is coming to your high school virtually or otherwise, that's likely gonna be the counselor who's actually doing that second read on the application. So a great way to be able to connect with them. Similarly with maybe college fairs or other type of offerings that we may have, you might have that chance again to reach out and meet with a one of the admission counselors as that chance. I should note though, if you ever contact an admission counselor that's not your territory counselor, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons, as I mentioned before, that we do a full committee and review process, that we bring in all of our staff members into these conversations, because there are times where I'll have a student that I've been meeting with who's not in my territory, but when I'm in that committee conversation, I say, oh, this student, you know, chatted with me or sent me an email or whatever it was, uh, and there's somebody that I, I got a chance to meet, and I know that they're super interested in Holy Cross. So that is still going to get brought in, even if you're not talking again directly with that territory counselor. Um, what do you think should be most highlighted when talking about extracurriculars and community service? The fact that you're involved in anything. Uh, there is no one call to action when it comes to extracurricular involvement. We don't need to see community service or athletics or theater or performing arts or whatever it might be. There's no one activity that we're going to say, yes, that's the one that's there. What we care about is that students have dedicated their time to improving their community through their involvement. And that's very much inherent in the Jesuit philosophy of Holy Cross. We believe that you're, as an active member of the community, you can better the community that's around you for yourself and for others. And if you're doing that in your high school community, if you're doing that in your local community, share that information with us. That's going to be the piece that really stands out to us. Not so much, again, that, you know, one activity or that one piece that's uh, one extracurricular activity, I should say, um, that's really going to stand out more than any other. Do grades in ninth grade count as much in grades in 12th grade? This is a fantastic question. Um, the answer is no. Uh, junior year and senior year grades carry much more weight in our process compared to freshman and sophomore year grades. And the reason being, junior and senior year grades are gonna give us just better context of the student that you are now today. It's so often the case that we see students with those strong upward trends. You know, they come into high school, they have that adjustment period where high school, you know, has higher level of expectations. Or maybe you change schools, maybe you change districts or something along those lines and you're getting to know a new social network in addition, of course, to adjusting to the high school level. If that's the case, you know, maybe we'll see those dips in grades early on, but it's how students respond to that that's going to be most important to us. So do we see that trend continuing upward coming into sophomore, junior, and senior year? The other thing that's important to note is that we understand freshman and sophomore year are typically a little bit more regimented in the classes that you're taking and a little bit more restrictive in the way that you're able to challenge yourself. So as you get into junior and senior year, many schools will open up that opportunity to be able to take, again, some higher level courses, some advanced level courses, and you have the freedom and ability to take some classes that are of more interest to you. So we also like to see, you know, how have you been able to take advantage of that flexibility and scheduling? Have you been able to take, you know, a, a course that's maybe a little bit different, but 
but clearly shows your interest in a particular area. And one other note about classes in high school, we are a liberal arts institution where every single one of our freshmen starts out as undecided. In other words, we read on what's known as a major blind admission process. So you'll notice on our read sheet, we have no information about what uh, major a student plans to be or whether or not they're applying to a particular school or major in the college because you can't actually do that at Holy Cross. You apply to the college in general. And that also means that we don't have any set requirements for the courses that you should be taking in high school. You have the freedom to take whatever it is that you like to, whatever interests you, however you wanna take advantage of the flexibility of scheduling, feel free to take advantage of that uh, when it comes to Holy Cross. As again, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna ask for a particular amount of subject areas or a particular level of subject areas. How do we submit a parent recommendation letter? Uh, that can actually be done uh, as part of the application itself. So after the application is submitted, we not only send an acknowledgement email to the student, but we also send an acknowledgement email to the parents saying, thank you so much for your you know, son, daughter, um, uh, or stepson, stepdaughter, whatever it might be, has applied to Holy Cross. We invite you to actually fill out this recommendation letter. So that's actually gonna be done um, through an online system. You'll get a link directly that's, uh, that's unique to your student and you can actually fill it out directly that way. We also do have some parents who just email them or mail mail them over to us and that's fine as well. We can also add them to the application file that way. Uh, let's see, I just wanna scroll. Community service is something that is, uh, that's really changed me and affected me. I was thinking about uh, writing that in my supplemental essays. Um, absolutely, yeah. If it's something that's important to you, if you feel that it's had an influence on your character as a person, uh, then absolutely share that information with us. You can do that, of course, in your college essay. You can share that with us in the Holy Cross response where we say, hey, is there any additional information that you wanna to share to us? Once again, we can go back to this student and they decided to say, I forgot to list my theater involvement on the application. Here's what I wanna share about that. Similarly, again, if you wanna provide more context, I've had this community service project, I've had this club, this organization, I've had this leadership opportunity, I've had this research program, whatever it might be that has really been influential in my development as a person, then you can share that with us here in this Holy Cross response, in the additional information session, in the interview. Again, you have a lot of ways to be able to convey all of this information to us here at Holy Cross. We're trying to get to know you as a person. What are the pieces that have really played into your, uh, into your own personality? How does it work for an international student who only attended the last two years of an American high school? Do you consider the transcripts for the first two years outside of the U.S.? Yes, we absolutely will. We're going to be looking at all four years of your sort of high school experience, uh, whether it's international or in the U.S. Similarly, with if you transfer high schools uh, within the U.S., you know, we're going to pay attention to those pieces. We're going to have notes on that over here on the read sheet as we look at it. It would likely say maybe over here, one advanced course, four A's and two B's. And then we would have in parentheses, um, I don't know, uh, any town USA high school number two. And then over here, we would see, okay, they, then they transferred into that first high school. That's also going to be giving us a little bit of context because we understand that with a transfer process, whether it's just to another school in another district, in another state, in another country, that's an adjustment period as well that a student is going through and also could contribute again uh, to grades in that process. So that again, provides us with that context and allows us to be able to have that conversation um, regarding the, uh, that particular circumstance. If a student does not apply as an early decision candidate, does that imply you're not as excited uh, that does that not imply to you excuse me that they are not as excited to attend the college absolutely not early decision is going to be a choice for some students if they cannot if they they choose that holy cross is absolutely their first option and this is the school that they can see themselves at great you know they can apply early decision that lets us know of course that we know holy cross is their number one choice but we also understand that it's not necessarily feasible for every single student to go through an early decision process nor is it just i mean practical for every single student to look at an early decision process it's one of the reasons why the vast majority of our applications come through regular decision is that you want to have options in this college decision process in many different cases and we are not going to penalize you for that in any way shape or form we understand this is your process you can choose to apply again early decision regular decision, whatever is the best fit for you. However, if you do apply through that regular decision process, you do still want to share with us that you're interested. And again, you can do that through those pieces of demonstrated interest. Do the interview with us. Let us know that you're interested. Hey, be a part of this July advisory seminar. Join a, a campus tour and visit campus. Let us know again that you've gotten to know the college. Those pieces are going to contribute to the conversation and say, clearly this student is interested in Holy Cross. Whereas if student is applying regular decision and they come through with what's known as a stealth applicant, one of the fancy admission terms, essentially they apply and we've never heard of them before. They didn't visit campus that we know of. Uh, they didn't attend any of our virtual offerings. They haven't emailed us. We've never heard of this student outside of the application. You can imagine in that context, in that conversation, we're going to be asking the question, 
does this student know Holy Cross? You know, have they gotten a chance to really get to know us? I'm, I don't know. And that's not, some, that's not a position that you want to be in in the conversation in the admission committee process where we're asking, I don't know. If there's ever anything that you can clarify, if there's anything ever, ever that you can provide more information on, we recommend that you do share that information with us. More information is always better for us to have in these conversations compared to less information. And similarly, when it goes to demonstrated interest. How are grade trends looked at? If I had straight A's and B's in freshman and senior year, will that make my application look bad? Absolutely not. Um, trade, grade trends are something that we do take into consideration. So as I mentioned earlier, looking at a student's transcript, we are of course gonna be paying attention to freshman and sophomore year. We don't completely discount those years by any means. But at the same time, if we see that upward trend, if we see that a student has been consistently strong throughout high school, if we see that there's sort of an unexplained dip in grades, then we're gonna ask that question. We're gonna say, okay, what changed for this student and what about it you know what about these grades uh what about the most recent grades i should say is telling us how successful the student will be on the college level so those trends again are something that just gives us greater context once again and this is going to be a common theme that we're talking about uh throughout the entirety of process is context um what are we seeing in the student what has happened to them throughout their high school experience and ultimately how successful do we feel they could be on that college level do you read many applications from students who switch high schools during the middle of the four years and would this have a significant impact on the application? Um, we absolutely read applications where that happens for sure. We read applications where a lot of things happen. Students go to one high school over four years, students go to three high schools over four years, students transfer high school in the middle of senior year, students transfer high school. We've seen it all, I can tell you that much. And that's another benefit to doing the read process in the way that we do in that, again, that first read, that random read process lets us see all of these different situations that happen to each individual student. It's not gonna negatively affect a student if a student has transferred. It's not gonna negatively affect a student if you know it's happened at any point in the high school experience. It's just gonna be, again, taken into consideration in context as part of our process. Woo, with all of that said, uh, we are now coming up on about an hour on this process. I'm so glad to see that it was such an engaging uh, conversation. And I hope that this was helpful, again, especially for those of you going through that college search process, getting started with it. Um, we hope again to be able just to provide a little bit more context as much as possible. As I mentioned before, this will actually be archived on our website. So if you'd ever like to watch this again, take a look at the read sheet and see all those pieces of detail, you can absolutely do so by visiting our junior advisory website. Uh, and we'll be so happy uh, to be able to provide you again with that information. Uh, I want to say thank you all so much for joining us. Again, I hope this was helpful in the process. Best of luck to everybody in your own college search. And uh, obviously, have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us.